The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sammy Shah. This is Ear to Asia. China's focus on undersea cables extends beyond commercial interests and encompasses military and strategic advantages. So it becomes a great way of establishing digital presence. And this digital presence allows countries to exert tremendous control on vulnerable populations. When you have a more strategic concretization of this competition between the U.S. and China, I think there's a real consideration to be taken by stakeholders in third countries as to whether they're going to be sleepwalking into competition or whether they're going to be making very aware decisions with each cable contract that they enter into. In this episode, the geopolitics of undersea cables in the Indo-Pacific. Air to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. In our interconnected world, the vast networks of undersea cables snaking across the ocean floor are the arteries ferrying data between continents. Between 95 and 99% of all transoceanic digital communications travels via these cables facilitating everything from international banking and e-commerce to video calls and intelligence sharing. Largely out of sight and out of mind, this critical infrastructure worth tens of billions of dollars underpins the global digital economy and communication systems we rely on daily. But these vitally important cables are facing increasing risks from shipping accidents, natural disasters, geopolitical tensions, and even the threat of sabotage. Recent events like the Nord Stream pipeline attacks and repeated cable cuts near Taiwan have raised alarm bells about the vulnerability of this infrastructure. No region highlights these challenges more than the Indo-Pacific region, where technological competition between the US and China has led to a fragmented cable network, each embedded with contrasting technical standards, governance models and geopolitical implications. This has forced Southeast Asian nations, among others, to choose between American and Chinese infrastructure, often making political choices around what should be engineering or standards-based decisions. So, how are nations navigating this difficult balancing act, and what role should regional frameworks play? With reliance on digital data flows only intensifying, what steps are needed to enhance the resilience and protection of undersea cables? And what potential consequences could major disruptions hold across sectors? To examine the underappreciated but indispensable world of undersea cables and the politics around them, I am joined by Elena Noor, Senior Fellow in the Asia Programme at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and by Cynthia Meboob, a politics researcher and PhD scholar at the Australian National University. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Elena and Cynthia. Hi, Sammy. Hello, Sammy. Lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for being here and joining us on Air to Asia. Let's begin with the basics here. How important are undersea cables to the world in 2024? Elena? So very important is the short answer. We're talking about communication cables. And for developing regions like Southeast Asia, where internet penetration rates average over 50%, with growing demand for data bandwidth, Communication cables are essential to growing the economy, but also providing connectivity to the populations of Southeast Asian countries. The figures vary, but essentially communication cables provide 97 to 99%, depending on which source you look up, of uh, communications, digital communications to the whole world. So in short, Communication cables are super important for connecting us all. Is there a a dollar term we can put to that? Well, again, it depends on your sources, but the 
Communication cables underwater is valued at somewhere between 20 to $30 billion. So there's a lot of money to be made, but also a lot of money to be spent in constructing and laying out the infrastructure of these subsea cables. Can you give us an idea then of the engineering effort that goes into the manufacture and installation of undersea cables? With the caveat that I am not a technical person, I've never been on a ship to witness the laying of these cables, my understanding is that there's a lot that goes on in the construction of these cables. So for example, the cables themselves are made of uh, different materials, including copper, and so that has to be extracted. And then there has to be insulation of these cables Many, many reams of types of insulation from brass, as I understand it, to different kinds of hemp to protect against the vulnerabilities underwater, whether it's from worms or from fish or from weather. And then it has to be spooled onto these huge reels that are eventually lowered into the ocean and reeled out onto vast networks of thousands of kilometers from point A to point B. And so you can imagine the capital outlay that has to be spent in order to just build, but also to lay out these cables across continents in some cases. Cynthia, cables are only one part of this large cross-border network. Other components include satellite stations, data centers, 5G network services, etc. Can you tell us a little bit about the landing stations for undersea cable networks? Where do we find those and how important are they in their role in the networks? Absolutely, Sami. Thanks for the question. So broadly speaking, cable landing stations are crucial facilities located along coastlines or major waterways where submarine communication cables make landfall. So these landing stations serve as the entry and exit points for these cables where they are linked to the terrestrial infrastructure such as fiber optic cables and um, microwave towers and satellite links. So in addition to providing connectivity, cable landing stations also play a vital role in ensuring the reliability and security of the network. They are designed to withstand severe weather conditions and natural disasters. They're also equipped with backup power supplies and redundant communication links to maintain uninterrupted service. And moreover, it's important to note that stringent security measures are implemented to safeguard the integrity of the network against unauthorized access and cyber threats. So because my interest is in international security, from that perspective, landing sites are the most critical locations for securing data. They serve as key collection and transmission points. They allow actors to monitor copy and in some countries censor international traffic. So they serve as convenient locations for national firewalls in certain nations such as China to restrict access to prohibited websites and media reports, for instance. So essentially, um, cable landing sites are where countries exert control over the flow of traffic into and out of their territories. In a very interesting 2008 essay, James Fellow, he discussed this intriguing information processing technique that China employs, by the way, where data entering the country is physically mirrored, which basically implies that China creates copies of all the incoming data at the landing points. So while there were critiques of this understanding that, you know, China basically runs the Great Firewall and how no other country besides the U.S. can sift through such huge amounts of data. Later on, some technologists believe that Huawei, which is a Chinese private company, in fact, developed the necessary technology to copy and analyze large amounts of data, as large as the United States analyzes. So it is for this reason that control often achieved through ownership of cables and landing sites is becoming an increasingly important issue in international security debates. So in my own research, the most interesting thing that I've noticed recently is that being able to own cable landing stations is not the only game in the proverbial telecommunications security town. 
So who gets to manufacture these landing stations is also a point of contention for nation states because these landing stations are fully automated and can be tampered with. Well, let's talk then about some of those major risks to the undersea cables. Um, You know, other than, for example, a shark biting it, uh, what accidental and intentional issues could affect the security of those cables? Cynthia. Um, Look, from my perspective, I'd say that the most common kind of risks faced by these cables are called shunt faults. So imagine you have this really long cable underwater that carries very sensitive information and messages from one place to another. Now, to make sure that the messages can travel really far without getting weak or lost, there are these special torpedo-shaped boosters called repeaters or amplifiers placed along the cable. So they work kind of like um, power-ups in a video game, making sure the messages stay strong. Now, these boosters need power to do their job right, Well, they get their power from both ends of the cable using something called a power feed equipment. It's kind of like giving them batteries to keep them running. The equipment sends a special kind of electrical energy through the metallic part of the cable to power up these boosters, but sometimes things can go wrong. Imagine the cable gets a little damaged like a tiny hole in a water hose. If that damage lets water in, it can cause a short circuit, which is, of course, bad news. So... In the hypothetical cable that we're speaking about, if the insulation around it gets damaged, it can create a short circuit from the metallic part of the cable to the seawater around it. When this happens, it's called a shunt fault. It's kind of like a glitch in the system, but here's the cool part. Even with this glitch, if the boosters on the cable can still get enough power from the equipment on one end, they can keep doing their job. So it's kind of like having a backup plan so the cable can still carry messages while waiting for someone to come and fix the problem. And what can cause that damage? Well, it can be a lot of things. So like big ships dropping anchors and fishing boats or even strong underwater currents. And even, of course, sea creatures like sharks sometimes get very attached and attracted to the cables and then damage them. So according to the International Cable Protection Committee, basically it is shunt walls that are the most common kind of walls. I would just point out there are also some natural underwater phenomena that can result in the damaging of these cables. The Tonga cable damage was actually a result of underwater volcanic activity. And that basically just cut off internet to Tonga and from Tonga for a number of weeks. But I think some of the more common causes for damage of communication cables underwater have been, as I pointed out, a result of ship activity. When you consider that global shipping and global trade by shipping activity in very busy areas like the South China Sea, like the Taiwan Strait, and even off the coast of the continent of Africa, you might understand why a number of these cables are susceptible to ship activity and whether it's anchoring or just ships passing through that can result in the cutting of cables. And very recently, we've seen some examples of this in the Red Sea, where I believe three cables were cut, but also off East Africa, resulting in internet disruption in a number of countries, including Kenya and Rwanda. So... The vulnerabilities of these cables are actually more common than we think, and that's why there have been calls to protect the resilience of these cables from a number of stakeholders, including countries and the private sector. Well, Vietnam experienced an unprecedented scenario where all its major undersea cables malfunctioned in 2022-2023. What were the challenges that time in repairing these cables and restoring connectivity? Vietnam is a really good example of what happens when you have almost all your cables cut at the same time over a very busy period. This happened over Tet or the Lunar New Year. And uh, so there was the difficulty of not only getting repair ships that were capable of and able to get to the area in rapid time, This is a general problem 
for many countries all over the world because there are only a limited number of repair ships that are available at any one time. It's also very expensive in general for repairs to take place. But there are also operational issues um, such as the issuing of permits and licenses that can be a hurdle for the timely repair of cut cables, for example. So in Vietnam's case, four cables were cut at the same time and then the fifth went out. And Vietnam at the time was also in the process of trying to build redundancy in its cable capability provision. Unfortunately, those redundancies had not yet been in place. And uh, so it learned very quickly how important it was to not only have that resilience in place in terms of its infrastructure, but also I think it really brought home the urgency for many countries in the region, how important it is to have at its call the availability of these repair ships at any given time. Cynthia, how concerned should we be about the potential for state-sponsored sabotage of undersea cables? I guess when we talk about threats to undersea cables, historically it's been state actors that have raised the most concern. In my view, I would argue that their capabilities, intentions, and sheer impact still keep them at the forefront of worries for targeted physical security attacks on submarine cables. Because if you think about it, it's often state actors who have the specialized expertise and equipment needed to identify and sever cables in deep waters, where the consequences would be most severe and strategically significant. Sure, there was this recent incident in the Red Sea, for example, where three submarine cables suffered cuts. I think it was in late Feb. According to industry sources, one of those cables, which was Europe-India Gateway, was already down at the time due to a previous cut that occurred in early December. So the operational impact on internet communications of a second cut was, uh, well, uh, let's say almost minimal. So initially, there was speculation about the cause of cuts with experts questioning how Yemen would have pulled out such an undersea attack. I guess some people who were looking at cables uh, from the industry, they came up with were that it could have been divers with cutting gear. It could have been, let's say, a submersible. It could have been underwater explosives. But before long, a more realistic theory emerged from the cable industry itself, which was that days before the three submarine cable failures, there was actually a United Kingdom-owned cargo ship, which was struck by missiles from Yemen. So the crew dropped anchor and abandoned the crippled ship and afterwards, as it began to drift, dragging its anchor, one of the top causes of submarine cable cuts, according to the International Cable Protection Committee. So that kind of was the reason why all these cables got cut. So I think that uh, we could still argue we're still pretty much in the dark about who did it, but it appears that it could have been anything. It could have been state-sponsored. It could have been just the anchor. All right, let's talk about the major players. Who are the major players in the undersea cable space? Which countries? And then also which corporate and business entities as well? Cynthia, I'll come to you first with this. So there are basically only five factories in the world that manufacture these cables, and they're all strategically located just by the ocean. So the owners of these factories are some of the biggest players because they literally hold all the cards at the moment, at least. And when it comes to nation states, so we have the United States heavily invested in the undersea cable market, primarily through its leading company, Subcom. So Subcom has a very interesting history, and Reuters did a report about it last year, which was that Subcom was a Cold War project. So they were created by the State Department during the Cold War because they wanted somebody to tap Russian cables. After the Cold War, they worked with other states too, so they were laying cables for China, but now they work exclusively with State Department. So Subcom is one of the major players. And then we have China with its HMN tech, which supplies 18% of the submarine cables at least. 
but that number is coming down because of the United States and Australia's very successful campaign against China. And then there is uh, Japan's NEC, one of the major players, and France with its Alcatel. So 80% of all the cables supplied and manufactured to the rest of the world come from these three companies, NEC in Japan, Subcom in the United States, and Alcatel submarine cables in France. And you'd imagine that perhaps it's HMN Tech with the other 20%, but it's not because we are in the gray about who manufactures the other 13% or where do these cables come from? Or perhaps it's Subcom because that's kind of what some publications are saying. But at least 7% of the rest of the market share comes from HMN Tech. Alina, is there any one left then that Cynthia might not have talked about for any major country that is subsidizing this? And can you describe the governance model for undersea cables, given that they cross international boundaries? So increasingly, there are companies like Meta and Google that are becoming major players in the submarine communication cable space. They have the money, the resources to lay these cables, and they're becoming the sole owners of a number of these cables that connect Asia to the United States, for example, as well as cables in and around Africa. So in terms of the ownership structure, it used to be a consortia of private companies that would get together and contribute the capital outlay to these very expensive projects. But increasingly, that ownership structure is changing so that you have big tech companies as the sole owners of these cables that then connect actually these cables to the landing points and to the data centers that they own and run. So it's almost become a complete change in ownership that is really upending a lot of the commercial considerations that we had in the past. On your question of governance structures, it's a very complicated one, honestly speaking. And as you rightly pointed out, there are different countries, different jurisdictions at play. And there is a patchwork of laws, domestic and international, that govern this cable network worldwide in what some consider to be a very inadequate manner. So I mentioned earlier on that this difference in permits and licensing causes some delays in repairs, for example, but they've also caused some delays in the laying of these cables. Some of that has been driven by geopolitical considerations, but you have, for example, the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea, which addresses some aspects of cable laying, but not all of them. You also have regional guidelines that may not necessarily be mandatory, but that are more codes of conduct. Um, so the Association of Southeast Asian Nations has a set of guidelines on the issuance of permits and licenses to streamline activity in this space. But it doesn't on its own regulate the laying or repairs of these cables, for example. So there's a patchwork of mechanisms and frameworks that are available, but not a comprehensive set of rules. What about protection under international law of these undersea cables? How does responsibility divvied up there? So responsibility is divvied up partly by UNCLOS, the Convention on the Law of the Sea. It regulates what can be done in what areas of the sea as it relates to the land, for example. But uh, again, there are different interpretations sometimes by different countries on what is allowed in the territorial sea, for example, so 12 nautical miles from shore or in the exclusive economic zone, which stretches to 200 nautical miles. So countries can have differing interpretations of UNCLOS, which sometimes makes it a little complicated when there are companies or repair ships that are waiting to enter but they might not necessarily know what exactly to do because of these differing domestic interpretations of international law. Um, Cynthia, how do standards play a role in undersea cables? Uh, who sets those standards in the first place, in fact? 
as far as I'm aware, there are no internationally recognized quantified standards in the undersea cable space. But bodies like the European Union, they have come up with their own set of guidelines and ASEAN has their own guidelines. So there is a need for these bodies to come together and come up with a universal framework that would be acceptable to everyone. But as you can imagine, it's hard because countries have different priorities. We've got plenty of emerging economies with increasing digital needs. So um, they wouldn't necessarily want to adhere to the standards that the United States or China set for them. But there are legal frameworks that countries at the moment are sort of coming together on. So there is BBNJ, which is a treaty on uh, biodiversity. I think it was just last year when BBNJ was signed. And the cable industry at the moment is extremely divided when it comes to BBNJ because BBNJ is setting standards for the industry and telling them how to operate in relation to the natural environment. And of course, these considerations aren't exactly welcome because they are not conducive to business needs. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sammy Shah, and I'm joined by undersea cable researchers Cynthia Mehboob of the Australian National University and Alina Noor of Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We're talking about undersea cables and how they shape the Indo-Pacific economically and politically. Elena, to what extent are the digital economy ambitions and policies of Indo-Pacific countries directly reliant on undersea cable networks? They're very reliant. As I mentioned in the beginning, you have a very digitally ambitious region like Southeast Asia that is basically hedging its economic growth on everything digital and is hugely reliant on the availability and resilience of these communication cables. So when you have a region that has basically, uh, as I mentioned, more than 50% internet penetration rate in the region and growing, when you have a region that is poised to have a data center market growth of uh, some 20 more in addition to the over 200 data centers that it already has now by 2027. A lot of it relies on the reliability of these communication cables and the availability of even more communication cables. So they're very much interdependent, this aspiration for economic growth and cable connections underwater. A lot of these developing countries are basically leapfrogging technologies. So even if you have a majority of a country's population that is reliant on just handphones, for example, smartphones, because a majority of uh, digital connection is made through these submarine communication cables rather than through satellite, for example, even countries that are just emerging into the market are going to be hugely reliant on many of these communication cables underwater. I just wanted to add something here. So Australia in 2016, 2017, stepping in, wanting to build the Coral Sea Cable. And it has been very useful for Solomon Islands, PNG, and other Pacific Island countries. But I guess what I want to say here is that, so undersea cables get connected to terrestrial networks, and that's kind of how internet data or messages are distributed. Cables cannot work alone. We've established that they need data centers, they need landing stations, and they need terrestrial networks. So while Australia built the cable and then later on also stepped into the Pacific to acquire the digital network. Australia alone cannot provide terrestrial connections to the entire Pacific nations. 
And China is filling that gap in a big way. Now, unfortunately, what happened earlier this year was that the United States has warned the Pacific nations to get rid of all technology supplied by China. And this includes 167 or 169 cellular towers. These countries are majorly disadvantaged when it comes to uh, terrestrial networks. So what the U.S. is doing is, of course, neocolonial and also sets a very bad example as to its uh, tall promises. I mean, the U.S. has been saying that it wants to see these countries develop in the digital realm, but it puts countries in the Pacific in a very difficult spot. And I can't imagine it being any different from countries in Southeast Asia. Well, that does kind of nicely work towards our next question. Are Southeast Asian countries being forced to choose between the infrastructure provided by China or the US and its partners? And and how then does that result in a fragmentation perhaps of the cable networks or their technological capabilities? Cynthia. So if you look at the cable networks from a more technical perspective, it's not exactly easy to create a bifurcation, to be honest, because the network is connected, right? It is not isolated. One cable does not get isolated from the other very easily. And there are redundancies built in the system. So if you think about the Coral Sea cable again, the international transmission part is built by the US. But what connects Port Moresby to other locations in PNG is built by China. So I think that some of the things that we've heard from uh, political leaders, they are just securitization actions, essentially. They are not getting materialized as such when it comes to infrastructure. But in Southeast Asia, we see countries picking and choosing very carefully when it comes to digital infrastructure. So they are involved in cyber capacity building programs with China and with Australia, and with the United States. So they are accepting all the help they can when it comes to building infrastructure and when it comes to building capabilities and capacity. Alina, is there anything you'd like to add then on that divide between China and the US when it comes to client countries, particularly in Southeast Asia? Yeah, I think there are reasons for concern to be had by Southeast Asian stakeholders. If you remember, I spoke very briefly about the changing ownership structure. And part of the competition that's playing out is in the national security agreements that the U.S. government is co-opting companies like Meta and Google into making with it. And that national security agreement is mainly to protect the data of U.S. citizens The complication, of course, is that it's very hard to disaggregate whose data is whose when they're flowing through all these cables. But if there's a way to segment the protection of U.S. citizens' data from the data of other populations and countries, then I think there's a real concern to be had about how other countries are going to initiate similar agreements with a company like Meta or Google as the owner of a cable so that their population's data will be similarly protected. There's another way that this geopolitical competition is playing out. Cynthia had mentioned subcom. And one of the cables, the Southeast Asia, Middle East, Western Europe cable, CMEWE cable, saw the Chinese players being forced out of the consortium, mainly because of U.S. pressure. Initially, HMN Technologies was supposed to have gotten the contract to lay this cable because they were more competitive in terms of pricing. But because of U.S. pressures behind the scenes, including some hand-wringing, arm-wringing in embassies in different parts of the world, you saw Subcom eventually win out this contract. And so the idea that there can be a change of ownership even midway into a project because of geopolitical considerations, I think is going to have to be front and center for many stakeholders that are going to be involved in these sorts of consortia. Um, And finally, I'll just add that companies have also been rerouting their cables to avoid the geopolitical clashes at sea. 
predominantly in Southeast Asia within the South China Sea because there have been concerns that there are going to be more serious flare-ups in the South China Sea, you have cables that have been rerouted through the Java Sea instead of the South China Sea, which uh, is probably more costly because of the longer route um, that has come about because of these geopolitical tensions playing out in the maritime space. How do undersea cables feature in China's Belt and Road Initiative? Um, To take a step back, it's very difficult to determine what exactly is a Belt and Road or a Digital Silk Road initiative. I worked on the Belt and Road initiative in Malaysia, and one of the difficulties we had from the very beginning was to figure out what exactly is a private driven project and one that is really under the, the ambit of the Belt and Road initiative. But even if we were to take it broadly, you know, I think submarine communication cables play a huge role in China's Digital Silk Road initiative. HMN Technologies was one of the key players within the Chinese space, uh, but because they've been edged out in a number of contracts, they've had to figure out parallel routes to lay their cables. And as Cynthia said, this has actually become a sort of uh, leverage for a number of countries because when you have parallel cables that traverse similar countries in the same regions, it provides for a certain amount of redundancy for those host countries. But of course, as you pointed out, Sami, there's also a risk of fragmentation. Um, And when you have a more strategic concretization of this competition between the US and China, I think there's a real consideration to be taken by stakeholders in third countries as to whether they're going to be sleepwalking into competition or whether they're going to be making very aware decisions with each contract that they enter into. I'd just like to add a couple of things to what Elena just said in relation to China, DSR, and Chinese ambitions. So um, something really interesting happened in 2016 when China significantly upgraded its communications capabilities in the South China Sea. So the move not only enhanced its data transmission in the region, but also strengthened China's command and control capabilities in the contested region. And these upgrades came shortly after the tribunal's hearing in The Hague that ruled against China's territorial claims, underscoring the strategic timing of these developments. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that China's focus on undersea cables extends beyond commercial interests and encompasses military and strategic advantages. And it aligns with what This report by Rand Corporation said in 2022, which was that increasingly undersea cables have become a tool for countries to extend their digital presence into regions where they don't really have any forced deployment. So it becomes a a great way of establishing digital presence. And this digital presence allows countries to exert tremendous control on vulnerable populations. Elena, there are cases where the US has given security conditions on undersea cables involving Chinese interests. Can you give us some examples and tell us how those conditions are meant to be applied? Is there anything you can add about things like CMEV6 and the global crossing? Yeah, I mentioned CMEV6 and how that forced out the Chinese players from the consortium. With regards to global crossing, you know, I think for Southeast Asia, this geopolitical competition was already a part of the subsea communications cable space from 20 years ago. So Global Crossings was a company that had significant networks all around the world and was the prize really for a number of countries in terms of its breadth of connections. When it filed for bankruptcy, there was interest from a number of companies, including a Singaporean and a Hong Kong company that decided to go for a joint bid for Global Crossings. But because Global Crossings was listed in stock exchange in the United States, the U.S. had a say in the ownership of Global Crossings. And the U.S. 
decided that it wouldn't be in its national interest for the Hong Kong company with links to China to own whether partly or fully global crossings. So it agreed to the Singaporean buyout of global crossings with certain conditions. And these conditions included things like the ability for U.S. authorities to show up at Global Crossing Office in the United States with 30 minutes notice, for example. It included a condition where there had to be certain nominees with a specific level of U.S. security clearance to be on the board of directors of the subsidiary of Global Crossing. It included um, the fact that it needed for a subsidiary of Global Crossing to be located in the United States. So these conditions preferenced the United States and its interests. But the fact that this already happened 20 years ago, and since then you've seen a number of other developments that have prioritized U.S. interests across what I call the tech stack, for lack of a better term. You saw it with 5G, for example. You're seeing it with submarine cables. You're seeing it with software applications like social media applications like TikTok. So there's a real interest by the United States government that has crept outwards towards what used to be primarily private sector activity that has a number of countries and companies concerned. So it sounds then, and forgive me if I'm wrong, that this is a bit of an ad hoc setup. How much of the undersea cable network in the Indo-Pacific is, you know, comprehensive and organized versus this kind of ad hoc approach? I push back a little and I'd say, actually, this is a very strategic approach by the United States government to ensure its dominance across different modes of technology, whether infrastructure or application. What is ad hoc, and you're right in this regard, Sammy, is uh, the response by other countries. Because I, I don't think it's seen, even though we just talked about global crossings and how this took place 20 years ago, it hasn't seen this mission creep, so to speak, by the U.S. government on a scale that we've recently seen. And so because of the fractured landscape of laws and permits and guidelines, we haven't seen countries coalesce into a more consolidated response, whether at the regional level or at the international level, to try to mitigate some of these disruptions within the submarine cable space in particular that we now need to take into consideration of. Well, when we talk about some of the threats to these, we, you know, we're looking at worst case scenarios, let's say potentially, what are the consequences of prolonged disruptions to undersea cable networks, not just for communication, as we've detailed, but also for sectors like finance, commerce and national security? Cynthia? So, well, prolonged disruptions to cable networks can have significant consequences uh, and across multiple sectors, of course. So financial markets, they rely heavily on seamless communications for transactions. And uh, well, these disruptions can lead to volatility and losses. In commerce, again, supply chain and logistics depend on uninterrupted connectivity with disruptions causing delays and also increased costs. And also national security, like we've already said, is at risk as military and government agencies rely on secure communications via these cables. And disruptions can hinder emergency services during crises, impact public safety. And so overall, safeguarding cables is crucial to preventing widespread economic, operational and security disruptions. Um, especially for instance, let's say in the finance sector, the whole sector would collapse. And it's not an exaggeration. Elena, given the lack of clear policies and governance mechanisms for undersea cable protection, then what more can governments do to enhance the resilience of this critical infrastructure? Are there any specific recommendations? Yeah, I think at the national level, there should be a closer coordination between the public and private sectors, but also increasingly because of the climate exigencies other civil society stakeholders that have a say in, for example, where landing points are located, where data centers are located, how much resource diversion there's going to be. And then from that national level of coordination, 
perhaps if there can be some sort of convergence on positions by all these different actors, there could be a regional level consultation or some sort of mechanism that would bring in these different stakeholders at the regional level. So for example, within Southeast Asia, uh, in ASEAN meetings, perhaps amongst the Pacific Islands at the Pacific Islands Forum, where there can be a consolidation of regional positions that can then, if necessary, be brought up to other international counterparts. So my idea is to have this kind of gradated approach to trying to streamline positions and approaches in order for there to be some sort of harmonization, if not consensus, on guidelines and regulations within the region or much further beyond. Cynthia? So um, I think that there's something that I truly want to add here because it frustrates me. It's almost like we're letting industry do all the heavy lifting and governments, if you look at the geopolitical landscape now, they're making huge demands of industry without really helping them out. So um, look at, let's say, these undersea cable companies using AIS, which is automatic identification system. It's a software. Basically, AIS allows companies to see the location of all ships in real time. So if a ship sails too close to a cable, they would actually just tell them using the transponder, they'd be like, you know, please don't do this. There is a cable there in that region. But sometimes AIS data is not correct. It can be a little bit faulty. And increasingly in Southeast Asia, especially, we've seen the issue of dark fleet emerge. So dark fleet essentially refers to ships that operate, you know, just silently going around, turning off their automatic identification system to avoid detection. And these can include vessels that are engaged in illegal activities, such as smuggling, unauthorized fishing, or evading sanctions. So by switching off their AIS, these ships become difficult to track, allowing them to move undetected and carry out activities that would otherwise be monitored and regulated. So this practice poses significant challenges, not only to maritime security, but all these cables too. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that we need a more robust policy that tackles this issue. And I know that Australia at the moment is having conversations around what could be done. But I think that this is a conversation that needs to happen not only on the regional, but global level. And on that note, our guests have been Alina Noor, Senior Fellow in the Asia Programme at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and Cynthia Mehboob, a politics researcher and PhD scholar at the Australian National University. Thank you both. Thank you, Sammy. Thanks, Sammy. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 29th of May 2024. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Param of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company. Thank you.